so high again. Now that we've seen how mitochondria transport anions, and mainly organic anions, such as substrates, I want to talk a little bit about cation transport in mitochondria, and I'm going to start with potassium transport. So potassium transport in mitochondria is very important because potassium is so abundant in the cytosol, and therefore is going to be abundant in the mitochondrial microenvironment. That added to the fact that mitochondria have an inner membrane potential, so they're negative in the matrix and positive in the intermembrane space, makes mitochondria tend to have a potassium leak. So potassium is one of the few ions that's abundant enough to leak through the bilayer in quantities that are significant functionally. Um, this, of course, is promoted by the fact that the respiratory chain pumps protons out and creates this electrical gradient that attracts potassium into the matrix. Um, because mitochondria have this potassium leak, it was predicted since the beginning, since the development of the chemiosmotic theory by Peter Mitchell himself, that mitochondria would have a potassium extrusion pathway and actually would exchange potassium for protons. And in fact, uh, measurements of activities of mitochondrial potassium transport have demonstrated that mitochondria have a protein that exchanges protons for potassium in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This protein is very important because if mitochondria take up potassium through the potassium leak but don't remove this potassium, potassium uptake is going to be accompanied by water. This is going to swell the mitochondrial matrix, and if you don't remove this excess potassium, the matrix, is going, the matrix is going to swell so much that organelles can actually explode. So we need this potassium proton exchanging activity. And this was predicted even when uh, the chemiosmotic theory was launched by Peter Mitchell. Despite that, we actually do not know for sure, there's no consensus on what the molecular identity of this exchanger of protons for potassium in the inner mitochondrial membrane is. So an extremely important protein that we still don't know the identity of. This is something that we still have to discover. In addition to potassium proton exchange, uh, mitochondria were found to have, through patch clamp activities, a potassium entry pathway, which is inhibited by ATP, known as mitoKATP, or mitochondrial ATP-sensitive potassium channel. Uh, this was initially a bit surprising. Why would you need a regulated uptake pathway for potassium into mitochondria if we already have a potassium leak in mitochondria? So uh, my postdoc work actually was trying to find the functions for this regulated pathway for potassium entry in mitochondria. And one of the functions that we found was actually to regulate mitochondrial matrix volume. Um, so while this potassium entry is quite small and limited through KATP channels, it actually only decreases the membrane potential by maybe one or two millivolts due to the exchange with protons through the potassium proton exchanger. Uh, this doesn't really affect oxidative phosphorylation all that much. But the small increase in potassium uptake into the matrix actually increases the matrix content of water significantly. And this could be important to maintain the size and the shape of mitochondria, and therefore to maintain mitochondrial function. So one of the functions of potassium entry through this channel, regulated potassium entry through this channel, is regulation of matrix volume. Later on, we also found that the concerted action of potassium entry in exchange for protons while not uncoupling mitochondria significantly in terms of oxidative phosphorylation, this very small decrease in membrane potentials, was sufficient to regulate mitochondrial oxidant production. So if you look at measurements of hydrogen peroxide release, and we're going to talk about how we measure this in our last class when we look at oxidant production, you can see that the production is about 15 to 20 percent lower when potassium channels are open versus when potassium channels are closed. And this is related to the small, mild uncoupling of the inner mitochondrial membrane potential by this transport. And we'll talk about this more and how this regulates mitochondrial oxidant production in the last class.
So potassium transport is important to maintain matrix structure, to maintain matrix size, and to regulate oxidant production. And that might be the reason why the opening of these channels is protective to heart cells under ischemic conditions. So opening of potassium entry into mitochondria is cardioprotective. Now, mitoKTP channels are not easy channels to study. Um, many people have troubles reproducing uh, the activity of these channels. And I really think that Paul Brooks's group contributed a lot uh, in understanding why we had so much trouble reproducing the activity of these potassium uh, entry points into mitochondria, these ATP-sensitive potassium channels. Uh, Paul Brooks's group developed an assay to measure the activity of these channels using thallium transport. And even more importantly, I think, they discovered how you could make these channels less labile, how you could conserve their activity for more time. Because for a long time, we actually had to do experiments with these channels very soon after isolating mitochondria because it was a spontaneous rundown of channel activity. Um, very fast ever after isolating mitochondria. So if you want to uh, measure the activity of these channels, have a look at this paper, and they have both an assay on how to measure the activity and also the condition in which the rundown of these channels is decreased. Because of this labile activity, for a long time, some authors did not believe in the existence of ATP-sensitive potassium channels. Um, but last year, a really important paper came out from Diego Stefani's, uh, De Stefani's group in which they finally identified the molecular uh, structure of these channels and identified it in a very similar manner that the transport and reconstitution experiments done before had shown. It's composed of a potassium inner rectifier, which is where potassium is transported, and also a regulatory subunit, which is inhibited by sulfonylureas and also where ATP binds. So now we know the molecular structure of this channel. Now we, in addition to using pharmacological regulators of this channel, can also manipulate cells genetically to further study the roles of these channels in mitochondria. So generally, how can you study potassium transport in mitochondria? and actually how you can study transport of many different ions in mitochondria. There's a very simple and cheap technique that you can do this in isolated mitochondria, which is by measuring mitochondrial swelling. And this works not only with isolated mitochondria, but also with reconstituted systems in which channels are reconstituted into liposomes, for example. So this is a technique that can be used in many different in vitro assays. And basically, it's based on the idea that if you have a cation uptake and an anion uptake, you're also going to have water uptake. There's osmotically obligated water uptake into this compartment that's the mitochondrial matrix or your liposome. And if you have water uptake into mitochondria, you're going to have a change in light scattering properties of your mitochondria. And mitochondria, when they swell, they actually scatter less light. There's less diffraction. And you can measure this decrease in light scattering in a normal uh, absorbance in a spectrophotometer. Even you can also measure this through a change in fluorescence. There's also going to be less light scattering in a fluorometer. So you can use normal spectrophotometers very simply to measure this uptick. Basically, you always have to remember that you have to have transport both of a cation and of an anion, and you cannot have enough concentration of a cation or anion within the mitochondrial matrix that it inhibits further transport of this, of this species. So here are a few examples working with potassium transport, but you could actually do this with other cations too. So if you suspend mitochondria in potassium acetate, now you have potassium and you have acetate. And acetate, in the form of acetic acid, is actually permeable to the inner mitochondrial membrane. So mitochondria can take up this acetate. However, on deprotonation within the matrix, this proton may accumulate. So the uptake of acid, acetate itself is limited by the transport of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. You can, of course, transport this proton back if the mitochondria are not energized, 
by using a proton ionophore such as FCCP. Under these conditions, mitochondria will swell if you have potassium entry also. And here, uh, potassium entry is illustrated by the addition of a potassium ionophore, which is valinomycin. But potassium entry could also happen through an ATP-sensitive potassium channel, for example. So if you have the concerted action of the transport of potassium, plus a mechanism in which protons can be transported out of mitochondria, you will have mitochondrial swelling, and you will have this decrease in absorbance. Uh, it's quite easy to measure that's typical of this swelling. And the swelling is happening because of the transport of protons and the transport of potassium. Um, you can transport these protons with FCCP, as done here, or you could add substrate to these mitochondria, make their respiratory chain work, and therefore pump these protons out of mitochondria and maintain this acetate transport. Under these conditions, you will also see mitochondrial swelling. Finally, you will see mitochondrial swelling if you have significant activity of potassium proton exchange, which is the same as adding a potassium transporter plus a proton transporter. Um, in this case, this is illustrated by the addition of nigericin, which is a potassium proton exchanging molecule, but it also could be because of a large activity of a potassium proton exchanger. And this is actually how much of the activity of these different channels was characterized in mitochondria through these kinds of light scattering measurements. And you could do this with potassium as is illustrated here, but you can also do this with other cations and other anions uh, using these swelling assays to measure the activity of these transport pathways. So that's what I wanted to tell you about potassium transport and general swelling assays to measure any kind of transport. I'm going to come back in the next video and talk to you about calcium transport, which is the last transport I want to talk about in this class. So till then.